If everybody could uh, find their seat, please, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, start the uh, Los Alameda City Council regular meeting on June 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, City Clerk. Do roll call. Mayor Edgar. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Kusumoto. Here. Council Member Cherko. Here. Council Member Hasselbring. Here. Council Member Murphy. Here. Great. Thank you. Uh, can I ask everybody to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance and stay standing for the invocation by Council Member Murphy? Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you allow us to live in this country where we can all come together, give our views, discuss as friends, and try and come up with the best government for ourselves. As always, we ask your protection for our fighter fires, firefighters, police officers, and service people around the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Can I get the council to join me down there? Okay. Here we go. Uh, my sister needs a ride home. Good evening. Uh, tonight we've got a lot of uh, presentations to do, so we're just going to go and get right into it. Uh, what I'd like to do first of all is I'd like to start off uh, and ask a couple people to come forward, uh, specifically uh, Cameron Toe and David Quintanilla from uh, Casa U Shelter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, w w when we uh, go ahead and recognize these folks, I would uh, like to see maybe uh, Pamela, you wouldn't mind joining me up here? Yeah. So full disclosure, and this wasn't uh, something I've been pushing for, but it's something that had to be done, is I'm also on the Casa Youth Shelter Board, and um, uh, tonight we're going to honor two really special people that uh, have done a lot, and these are the youth in our community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what they've done, each one of them, and then uh, we're going to give them a commendation. Uh, first of all, Cameron Toe. Uh, Cameron's been with Casa Youth Shelter uh, Youth Leadership Program for over four years. Uh, she has been on the leadership board for three, community outreach chair, fundraising chair, and she's now the president of YLP, and YLP is the Youth Leadership Program. Um, so uh, a little bit of an editorial. So the Youth Leadership Program, uh, being a board member, every month we go and we get to hear Pamela talk up this group like they've never been talked up. And what they're doing is that they're going out there and they're basically connecting to all of the youth in the different areas. Not only at the high school and, and trying to get people involved that, to make sure that the people that are out there that may have problems, but uh, also they're going on outreach tours to hotels, motels, uh, out in the community really to try and just connect with all these different people that are out there. So this is a, this is a shelter that is out there to try and help kids that are on the street. And part of the process is doing in the involvement in the outreach, the other part of it is to make sure that uh, once they, they actually get help, that we can help reunify and help uh, provide support to them. So um, and I'm also going to have Pamela talk a little bit about what they do. Um, Cameron has been uh, doing this. Uh, she's a leader of 14-member leadership board. Uh, she provides general supervision of all YLP events, and she acts as a liaison between the board and staff uh, facilitators. Um, she currently leads over 70 teams in business meetings and outreach activities for CASA. Uh, she's a natural leader. She's had the ability to bring peers together and focus on the projects, and she's accumulated over 1,500 community service hours with CASA for the last four years. Uh, lastly, uh, she's headed to uh, UC San Diego, where she's going to take a super easy major called Cellular and Microbiology. <laughs> yeah, so good job. Yeah, yeah. So on behalf of the city council, we would like to give you this commendation. And we <laughs> really thank you. Okay, next up, David Kentonia. Uh, David's been with the Youth uh, Shelters Youth Leadership Program for four years. Uh, he's been on the, the leadership board for three. He was a member at large and a community outreach chair, and he's now the vice president of YLP. Uh, as the Vice President, he plans to preside over all the team building activities, leadership, 
uh, activities that go on while maintaining his role. In addition, he's a primary liaison between the YLP and the Orange County Department of Education's Friday Night Live Partnership. Uh, he can be trusted to lead our youth uh, volunteers in fun and, and in times of sensitive training. He's uh, accumulated 442 community service hours. I gotta stop there, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> Um, and he, over his four years, he, and he's headed to Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, where he's going to go major in sports management. So, Jerry Maguire here. Um, I don't, oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, on behalf of the City Council, we just uh, really appreciate both of you guys' leadership in the city, and uh, it really starts with you guys, really leading by example. And uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Pamela, I sat through these board meetings at 7 in the morning, so it briefly, don't get uh, too far out there, but uh, why don't we talk a little bit about YLP, because I also want the community to know what goes on. Yeah, Chief knows how this can go too. <laughs> we, we love you, we do. <laughs> Well, I, I, I thank you, uh, Mayor Edgar. I wasn't prepared to say something, and I'll keep it brief. Thank you. For those of you who aren't familiar, um, as Mayor Edgar has said, uh, Costa Youth Shelter has an amazing high school volunteer program. So if you have any local high school youth that you know who would like to give back to their community, we'd lo love to welcome them with open arms. Youth can create change um, and awareness on issues. Um, and for us, it's regarding the shelter and youth-based issues. These teens are learning about human human trafficking and drug use and they're learning about child abuse and then they're going out into the community and educating and advocating on behalf of the youth who are too in crisis to really um, know how to educate and ad advocate on their, be their own behalf. And so um, I would just like to thank the City Council, uh, Mayor Edgar, for allowing this type of recognition for these extraordinary young people who give so many hundreds of hours of their time where they could be working at a job that pays them money, not pays them in community service hours, and they could also be doing a hundred other things and instead they, they chose the passion of Casa Youth Shelter to lead into the community and um, I can't wait to see where you're going to go in the future, and I'll end there. Thanks, Troy. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next presentation is uh, I'm going to ask Chief Acosta from the Orange County Fire Authority to come up and join me. Community, this is our fire chief uh, from Los Alamitos. So uh, every year about this time of year, we, uh, we go through and we do a proclamation uh, to the city and uh, this proclamation is on downing, uh, drowning prevention awareness uh, for people that have swimming pools in the backyard and, uh, and all of the activity of really trying to make sure and just raise awareness for what's going on. Uh, I'm going to ask the chief to talk a little bit about this week and w why it's so important uh, that uh, we, we put the message out there. So chief, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. <clears throat> well. Drownings are something that the OCFA really, uh, re really feel are, we're proud to, to um, have a drowning awareness program. The drownings that we have, we, I'm sure you know recently we had a high profile drowning in Cota de Caza. That just not only impacts the family, it impacts the neighborhood, the extended family, and the first responders. So it's a message that we want to deliver. Uh, we recognize May through October as drowning, uh, as water safety awareness. Um, I've got a couple of stats here for you. In 2017, there was 101 drowning incidents with 45 fatalities. That's just in Orange County alone. So yeah, that's a lot. Um, it's a leading cause of death in children under five. And we encourage all your residents here to visit the local fire station, pick up some pamphlets that have inf information packets as well as some water watcher tags. So thank you very much. Yeah, I also want to acknowledge uh, on our council, uh, our council, we actually appoint somebody to serve on the Orange County Fire Authority Board, and uh, I want to acknowledge Kessel, uh, Council Member Hasselbrink. So uh, she is actually our uh, board member, and she's actually Vice Chair of Finance Committee now. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, it, it, what's really been an honor being on this council is that each one of these council members up here get involved, they get appointed to a county board, and they get into a leadership position, and it really uh, sends a good light of uh, what's available here in Los Alamitos. So, Shelly, I just want to say thank you for everything you do, too. Uh, Chief, on behalf of the city of Los Alamitos, I want to proclaim Drowning Prevention Awareness May through October, and uh, we just want to thank you for coming in here. Thank you. Uh, next up, what I'd like to do is uh, have a very uh, special guest here tonight that I'd like to call up, and two of them actually. Um, I want to make a presentation accommodation to Mark Zito, who's the assistant special agent in charge of ICE for Orange County, and his boss, uh, Don Barito, who's the deputy special agent in charge of ICE for this area. Uh, if you guys wouldn't mind joining us, thank you. So this is a very special night for me, um, you know, to be able to have the opportunity to uh, give a commendation to uh, great leadership in Homeland Security. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kusumoto to go to the White House and meet with uh, the, the Homeland Security uh, Secretary uh, Nielsen. And uh, when I was there, I could not say enough about uh, the Assistant Special Agent Mark Zito. Um, this is a guy that a real stand-up guy uh, lives in the community. Uh, part of very has very important mission and you know anybody that's been following the sanctuary law issue this is not a political statement but this is a fact that as a city we're the only city in the state of California that can actually have the direct relationship with ICE at least until it gets overturned by lawsuit and what was possible was um, you know when you get to the point and you're starting to deal with this the honesty to the community is that do we have a problem with immigration in the community and the answer is no we don't um, I want to take the opportunity you know one more time that you know when we're going through this process this issue was about local control this is about we as a city were given a charter by the state of California to be able to form a city form a police department and charge our residents general fund money to be able to build a police department and the express right that we have as a city as a charter city is that we can actually set priorities to what our police do so SB 54 from our perspective basically took that right away from us as a city and that's what we stood up for and when that time came Mark Zito special agent uh, assistant special agent in charge of Orange County uh, was somebody that I was able to reach out to and get educated on what some of the larger cities are dealing with the complexities that this law brought into effect and between him and Chief Nunez who is been a partner with me through this process to really try to get a better understanding of both sides um, so you know for me uh, you know mark I just wanted to tell you thank you for everything that you've been able to do to help educate the process to be able to make sure that we're not saying stuff that's really not appropriate when it comes to the, the serious job that you guys have in keeping us safe and uh, we just really appreciate the partnership and uh, with that I just wanted to uh, be able to provide you accommodation on behalf of the City Council and as Mayor of the City of Los Alamitos and thank you for all the efforts that you've done. Thank you. So, so Mark, the other thing that I want to do uh, is uh, this is uh, something that is very special is that within our city uh, what we don't normally do is uh, give uh, tile plaques and uh, that's something that uh, you know for us is a big deal so I, I hope that uh, you'll be able to take this back to your office and uh, to show your staff and uh, I also want to say to your uh, your boss thank you so much again for the support I, I can't, can't tell you enough and uh, maybe he'll let you share that plaque <laughs> if you really like it I, I'll get you another one <laughs> but um, but again, and um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, if you would like to address the, anything with the community, that'd be great. No, I, I think it's small enough I can talk. I'd like to thank the mayor. I'd like to thank the city council for what... Be, me, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to thank the mayor and the city council for the time and effort they put in to, 
and, and Chief Nunez and his department for keeping Los Alamitos a great city. Um, I also would like to say I'm with Homeland Security Investigations and our agents work 24 seven. They really, they live in the communities and they really work very hard to keep the community safe. Everything from child exploitation task force, narcotic smuggling, money laundering, um, Counterproliferation. Counterproliferation, counter national security. Uh, we're the largest uh, contributor on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So we do a lot more than just immigration. And the agents really put their heart and souls into it. And they live in the communities and they want to keep our communities safe. Yeah. Oh, we appreciate it. So there's an ultimate test. So uh, I'm a military guy and so is Mark. So he, at the very beginning of this process, he gave me a challenge coin. And so the, there's a deal in the military that if somebody gives you a challenge coin and you offer to give them a handshake with the challenge coin, if they don't have the coin that they also, what ends up happening, he has to buy me a drink. So, <laughs> so I didn't tell him this before, but I just, uh, it looks like you have to buy me a drink. All righty, cool. I knew it would come in handy. So, okay, cool. Um, so thank you very much. Um, here, we'll get Uh, next uh, presentation we have, it's a uh, presentation of resolution of support from Linda McDonald, President of the Long Beach Republican Women Federated, Nancy Hathcock, President of Rossmore Los Alamitos Republican Federated, and Pat Biggerstaff, President of Seal Beach Republican Women Federated. Would you guys come up here and join us? So I'm going to let you guys do the talking because I think you're giving us something. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So whereas Long Beach Republican Women Federated, Rossmore Los Alamitos Republican Women Federated, and Seal Beach Republican uh, Women Federated come together for this purpose of this resolution. Whereas the Los Alamitos City Council voted on March 19th, 2018 and final approval on April 16th, 2018 to exempt themselves from California Senate Bill 54, commonly known as the California Values Act or Sanctuary City State Bill. Whereas the Los Alamitos City Council has led the way for other cities to pass similar resolutions and support a lawsuit filed by President Trump's administration against SB 54 and other California laws. Resolved that on this date of June 18, 2018, that Long Beach RWF, Rossmore Los Alamitos RWF, and Seal Beach RWF recognize and support the Los Alamitos City Council for their precedent setting anti sanctuary ordinance, leading the way for other cities to follow in their footsteps. We just want you to know that we are out there. We all support everything you do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, um, we are. Okay. Oh, okay. So we're done. Okay. We're done. <laughs> oh, congratulations. You got a number of Vladimir Putin would be a sh a proud of. <laughs> we had the most interesting thing going. Okay, uh, we've got a, uh, a, I guess the first presentation then we'll go through would be the uh, report from Orange County Human Relations, or do you, yeah, let, let's go ahead, we'll start with the Orange County Human Relations uh, representative uh, for presentation of the annual report. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, um, Council Members, uh, Chief Eric Nunez, and all community members. Um, I'm here tonight to report on some of the work of our nonprofit organization um, here in the city of Los Alamitos over the last year and to present you with copies of the annual report. I'm sure that you've all have um, present now. We believe all, that all people have a right to live free from discrimination and violence, mm -hmm. so we provide programs to create safe and respectful communities. And so in the last year, um, it's been a little difficult in our country, and we have struggled at times to remember that we are all united by our American identity. Uh, we have seen deep divisions and strife among leaders and even neighbors. However, at Orange County Human Relations, we have continued um, and moved forward with belief that we can all work together, together for a better purpose. Um, so Orange County Human Relations um, believes that our mission to build understanding amongst our diverse residents is more important now than ever. And this relationship building can contribute to a sense of community in our cities. Um, many of our programs are provided countrywide, such as our Hate Free OC, a public awareness and education campaign to create a hate-free environment in Orange County, bring diverse communities together, and promote peaceful, inclusive community where everyone can thrive. In the fall of 2017, launched a, a youth-focused campaign to educate young people about hate crimes and incidents. This campaign called No Hate logged over one million impressions online. Um, but we would like uh, to share with you today what, ha what we did specifically here in your city of Los Alamitos, where we mediated 11 cases as well as two family mediations in the courts or community where one of the parties was the residents of the city of Los Alamitos. In collaboration with Los Alamitos Police on hate crimes and with individuals or community groups on hate incidents, we only had documented one hate incident in Los Alamitos and conducted one police community reconciliation case. We work to build a sense of community among Los Alamitos residents and staff through our continued hate crime education, victim outreach, and support. And in conclusion, Orange County Human Relations has partnered with many of the cities, especially Los Alamitos, over the last 25 years to bring police and diverse residents together to build safe, respectful neighborhoods, develop positive relations among the broad spectrum of Los Alamitos residents, and to address community conflict and strife, sustain a human relations infrastructure to serve cities when crisis situations occur. So we are proud of the longstanding partnership we have with Los Alamitos and with so many other cities in Orange County. Together we are contributing to a safe and respectful county and building the important relationships that can be called upon in times of tension and turmoil. So we thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate Have it. Have a good evening. <clears throat> okay, so uh, City Clerk, uh, keep me straight here. Are they uh, not on the agenda at this point was presentation. From, Correct. Are and we going to do that at this point or no? Yeah, the museum um, is item 10i on your consent calendar. They would like to do a presentation since it is a consent yeah. calendar. So, so uh, Margaret, if you wouldn't mind uh, coming up and uh, we'd uh, like to get the presentation from the museum. Yeah. 
who give that so just as a, uh, a form of the process here is that uh, this is just a high level presentation there is actually an agenda item in here 10 a uh, or, or I'm sorry it's yeah it's good evening not. mr. mayor and members of the council my name is Margaret Kendrick and I live on 3231 Orangewood in Rossmore I, I have a presentation <coughs> a request to make for you First of all, you see in front of you a picture of Orange County, and, well, it's already gone. And um, the next one is, I'm a member of the Orange County Historical Commission, and the request I have is not for the museum, but to plaque, a comm a, with a commemorative plaque, the old fire station on the boulevard which was the volunteer fire station number two in los alamitos it existed from 1946 until 1973 when uh, the, the, the plant was moved on to i think it's green street uh, Next, I want to speak about the Historical Commission. You probably don't know about who we are and what we do. <clears throat> we are a citizens committee of 15 people representing, uh, representing each of the, uh, the supervisor districts with three members. I have been originally, uh, I was originally appointed by Harriet Wieder kept by James Silva, kept on again by John Morlock, and again by Michelle Steele. So I have a, a long life on that commission, and uh, I would like to see this commemorative plaque on the orange, on the building, we, we have on the building on the boulevard, because that is a 20th century adobe building built be, uh, because after World War II, there were no, uh, not much material avail available for construction, but the need for volunteer fire station existed. <clears throat> and there were several of the same design and the same make in Orange County. However, only a few still exist, and none of them are a fire station anymore. <clears throat> I also uh, like to speak on what we, the Commission, are doing. We, um, let me see, got to take off my guys. We were established in 1973 by the Board of Supervisors, and um, it came about because a group of citizens wanted to, the, the Board of Supervisors to get involved with more history in the county, to, uh, to preserve and uh, adapt buildings and uh, encourage the identification and preservation and adaptive result, reuse of their historic buildings, and many of which, many of which date back to the turn of the century, the prior century, I mean. <clears throat> and with the, uh, with the adoption of the Orange County Historical Commission, we became, uh, the, the board became in, involved in history in Orange County. At our monthly meetings, we, uh, we uh, you look at the reuse of buildings. We look at the archives which we helped establish, the Orange County archives, <coughs> as well as the paleontology of which the county is very rich, primarily from the Jurassic period. And we work with the Cooper Center and the, uh, and the California State College of Fullerton. Uh, we also work with Irvine, and so we are quite busy. We also have seven Orange County historical parks. And Mr. Kusumoto was at a meeting at a, at a meeting last year in in July, mm. of which I couldn't attend. Uh, our duties and objectives 
are to identify and promote the preservation and use of buildings, site structures and objectives, mm -hmm. and stimulate and encourage financial and partnership support for projects, the public and pri uh, for projects with the pri public and private sector. Co we, we are coordinating countrywide country programs and act as a liaison among local organizations. And we just did that in April down at Irvine, at the Irvine Agriculture Headquarters. And I'm always surprised seeing how many historic involved organizations we have in this county. It is amazing. And we also developed and maintain a central file of Orange County historical resources for public use. We encourage and facilitate cooperation among local historical societies and organizations, which is what we did in April. And we accomplished quite, quite a lot over the years. The, our first uh, accomplishment was uh, to, re uh, to restore the old courthouse again for use. And uh, we also have a museum exhibit at the old courthouse. We, uh, act, uh, we do the acquisition and planning of Orange County historical parks, including Heritage Hills, Irvine Ranch Headquarters, Key Ranch, Mocheska House, which is out in the canyons and gardens, Peralta Adobe, and Yorba Cemetery. And Yorba Cemetery was uh, actually the second historic ce cemetery in Orange County, <coughs> after the mission, of course. And it was given to us in very bad shape by the Diocese of Los Angeles. I'm still mad at the condition that cemetery came back to us. Since then, the county has uh, fenced it in, and uh, some local organizations have looked old in old <coughs> have looked in old church records for who whose souls are buried there. And so far, we found over 400 and have plaqued them. However, we don't know where they're buried, but sometimes an old gravestone still, st still turns out of people who finally find that they were guilty of doing something. Margaret, can I ask you a question? Because I know at the end of this, because this wasn't on the original agenda, you're really going to be talking about um, potentially asking us for a future agenda to uh, basically designate historical uh, uh, condition for St. Isidore or for the museum. I think that was where it's at. I, I just want to make sure that we know specifically, is, is that going to be the bottom line? Because the, the history is definitely important, but I want to make sure that the council understands what the request is. Yes, the request is for a historical plaque, a commemorative plaque on the building, mm -hmm. which houses now the museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is because that building is still one of the historical buildings existing in the county and in this city. Uh, the first plaque, and it, it actually shows you uh, the, uh, as I mentioned before, it, it, the first plaque I established was for the, for the original sugar beet factory. Right. in 1997 and this plaque would look similar to that at the sugar beet factory uh, at, at the location of the old sugar beet factory and just remember that old sugar, sugar beet factory was the very first in Orange County mm -hmm. and established the business of agri uh, agriculture business in the county. It was the first in the county and I was proud that it was in Los Alamitos. Yeah. And therefore I'd like to make the, the second plaque on the old fire station which is a 20th century adobe building sure. and uh, rep represents part of your history, of the city's history. Yeah, so uh, I, I appreciate that. And let me just save you there because um, when we actually do that, I'm going to, as the mayor, I'm going to ask to have that put on the, the next agenda. And then maybe when we do that as an agenda item, this history would be helpful too. 
so that you know, we make sure that we have the context because uh, you know when we have a building like this that we put a uh, plaque on, I know I'm, I'm involved with St. Isidore with something that we've also looked at there, pretty serious contemplation. So I, I just want to be able to give it its time. And okay. if by putting it on the agenda, we might be able to get more people in here that uh, are interested in history. And so I don't want to waste this opportunity and not have the right people here okay. to hear the story. Right. Uh, that that I, I'd, I'd like to see that. Sure. And so that, that's why I make this request in behalf of the museum. And on the last page, you see how this plaque would look. And it will describe the, the old volunteer fire station. Mm -hmm. And uh, the history of that is, is also on, your, uh, on, on the internet. And have you, do you have any any questions no and uh, i really can't the council can't ask you questions right now because it's not on the agenda we're just i'm really personally excited yes, about it and i, 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 I can't wait till we that, get it yes. come back and i'm happy i thank you very much for your time and i thank you for for letting me uh, make this presentation you're thank welcome you. margaret thank you mayor um if yes. i can just as you mentioned there is an item on the consent calendar item 10d related to the basically the annual yeah. requirements that the museum is required to submit to the city so as as you mentioned the mm -hmm. historic designation ask or request is not there but um, we could give a brief update on what the steps are now or just wait till 10d it's up to well, let's let's just wait till 10d and see if there's any other council members that want to pull it um, but I, I think the uh, gist of this is that uh, there, we absolutely cannot take an action tonight so, and I just want to give the museum the direction that we will absolutely agendize this, and I think you'll find that we'll be pretty favorable towards it. Um, but um, I think the item on the agenda is specifically to do with the budget and some of the things that are more tactical. Yes, that's correct. Okay, um, thank you. I really appreciate it, Margaret. Um, that was the last presentation. I think at this point, uh, what we'll do is um, we're gonna go ahead uh, to oral communications. Uh, at this time, any individual in the audience uh, can come forward and speak on any item that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Uh, it kind of wants to be uh, limited to no more than five minutes uh, per speaker. And I'll go ahead and open up the, uh, for public comments right now. Thank you. falling apart up here um, go ahead and get started here um, mayor Troy Edgar uh, mayor pro term uh, Mark Kizumoto, Shelley uh, council member Shelley Hasselbrink council member Richard Murphy and council member Mark Cherko. Um as you all know I've served on the my name is uh, Pete Carvajal I've served on the Los Alamitos Parks Recreation and Cultural Arts Commission consecutively since 2003 uh, since that time, I've served over a dozen different council members, um, several mayors, um, three parks and recreation directors, and several city managers. Um, I have publicly supported and endorsed most of you sitting up on the dais uh, tonight, and uh, I've always felt that even though I may have disagreed with one of you, uh, one of your positions, now and again, um, I knew that. Deep down, we always had in common a love for the city of Los Alamitos, and we always strived to do what was best for the majority, if not the whole of the city. Regretfully, this passion of mine to serve our community, specifically the children in our community, uh, can no longer sustain my continued support of you as a council. Since March and April, your decision to pass a divisive and extremely partisan ordinance against the state of California, SB 54, I have lost respect for the four of you who chose to vote. For this, for this ordinance. Initially, I asked why. Why would you choose to bring such a nasty partisan debate into our council chambers? chambers? I saw the rudeness and total lack of decorum allowed to continue and fester, and I stood in disbelief as the council chambers was allowed to deteriorate into a celebration of extreme right-wing anti-immigrant behavior. Why? Other than Warren, who I do believe deep down felt he had to speak out against SB 54, the rest of your motivations were extremely suspect to me. Um, Shelley, your argument that you were forced into this because you had to defend the Constitution does not hold water to me, as it is the federal courts that decide on the constitutionality of laws. Richard, your tepid vote in favor of the ordinance was in direct conflict of your statements and concerns. Um, 
But the one person that I feel, felt really drove this issue and allowed it to become a national news event was Mayor Troy Edgar. His statements that night and behavior since has convinced me that his motivations had been political grandstanding of the worst kind. The only person that asked the responsible questions was Council Member Mark Cherko. Um, so now I want to lend him my support by asking you now, uh, not the question why. I, I feel most of us understand the reason why. Uh, but the new question, how much? I want to know how much of our city funds are being spent on defending the ordinance when in fact the federal government is already attacking as before SB 54 in the courts. Mm -hmm. How much has been spent to date? I want to know this number. I looked at the warrant section of the agenda and it's very hard and difficult to see and I see a total, I estimate about $39,000 already spent in defense of this ineffective, and from your own words, we don't have an immigration problem in Los Alamitos, needless ordinance. How much more are you willing to spend? How much is your limit? At a time when our city is facing some very big budget liability issues, how much will be too much? I want you to take a public position on this. I think our citizenry, need to know if you are willing to spend, quote, whatever it takes, unquote. Because we may get to the point that your little partisan temper tantrum could very well cost our city some much needed services up to and included cops on the street. I have heard the argument that this, this is a public safety issue, but in reality, we don't have MS-13 in our schools and our streets. We haven't had an ICE raid in over a decade. You're spending money that could be spent on more cops in the safety of our city in defense of this ordinance that's unnecessary. Lastly, I'm extremely concerned that two of you that had the greatest part in pushing this needless ordinance will be leaving the council in the next year and we will all be left to not only clean up this mess, but we'll be left with the damn bills that will continue to pile up. It is under these circumstances that I formally tender my resignation from the Los Alamitos Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Arts Commission. I can no longer serve a city council that would choose divisive partisan political issues over the financial health of our small city. Those of you who voted in favor of this ordinance should be forced to answer at every meeting, every month, how much of our city money are you willing to spend? I'll pass along a copy, the signed copy of this to the clerk. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next up. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Monica Glicken. I am a local mom. Uh, I'm a member of Los Alamitos Community United. I'm also speaking to you as an attorney with the Public Law Center, which is a pro bono law firm in Orange County that's seeking to provide legal services to our most um, indigent and vulnerable residents. Um, it's in both of those capacities, I would like to talk to you about, also would like to talk to you about the costs of this Anti-Values Act ordinance. Um, Mr. Carvajal talked about the financial costs. I would like to talk to you a little bit about the human costs. Um, in both of my roles as a local community member and as an attorney serving those who, who um, are in our most vulnerable communities, I'd like to let you know some of the impacts that your ordinance have had. Um, because of the statement that this ordinance has made, we have uh, youth in our own community who are afraid to go to school. We have parents who are afraid to bring their children into public spaces. Uh, we have families that are afraid to do simple things like going to work or going to the hospital. And if you are telling yourself that this is an ordinance that only targets so-called illegal immigrants, um, I'm here to tell you you are mistake mistaken. Legal immigrants, legal immigrant families, even families that are American citizens but with immigrant ties have all felt um, the, the fear that this type of ordinance has sown in our communities, and most importantly, um, has felt the vacuum of the city council's uh, leadership in speaking out against the hate speech and right-wing um, behavior that has been emboldened by the ordinance, not just at our city council meetings, but in the press. Where are your statements to our immigrant communities who are part of the communities that you are sworn to serve? Where are your statements to them that the police is there to protect them? Where are your statements condemning the anti-immigrant uh, anti and hate speech that took place outside of your city doors 
telling people to go home, to go back where they came from, that they should be deported, that they shouldn't be raising their children here. Where are your condemnation of those statements? This is the moral leadership that you also provide as our local city council, not just in passing, um, taking care of the very important work of keeping our city running. You also are the moral leaders of our communities. And I would ask you as a local community member to take that, that duty more, serious, more seriously. It is not too late for you to rescind this ordinance, which is unnecessary. I encourage you to uh, exercise your voice in all the other ways that are lawful within our democracy, such as passing a resolution, such as uh, making, you know, having interviews, making statements, but why are you dragging our city into um, an unlawful ordinance which carries the force of law in defiance of a state law? It doesn't make any sense and it is hurting our immigrant communities. I'd like you to, to think about that seriously as you consider how to proceed. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Henry Joseph Sperg. You might recognize my name. I'm one of the plaintiffs in the case against you. I'm also a local business owner, and I've been a resident here since the 90s. Looking at what's happened here tonight alone affirms to me that this issue about the ordinance is really about your politics. You've invited the Republican women to applaud you. You've invited an ICE agent who provided apparently covert information to the mayor without making it public until tonight, and that he's in partnership with the city. I point this out because we started out this evening with a hearing about districting, which Mayor <coughs> Edgar made gratuitous comments about that he couldn't possibly know, couldn't possibly support with evidence because we haven't had districting here. And Mayor Edgar simply went off explaining to us that from his view, it's a fact that districting is bad. We've heard from Council Member Murray how bad it is and how it must fall, how if Sacramento gets its stuff together, it will reject this whole premise. Gentlemen, ma'am, you're wrong. Because you're not speaking from fact in terms of what's going to happen in our city once we have districting. I would submit to you that with districting, this whole debacle would never have happened. Because we would have had the opportunity to have different parts of our city elect different representatives to our council, rather than being elected at large so that the, the majority alone in this city would ride roughshod over everybody here and inflict their attitudes, their lack of evidence, their points of view on the entire city. There is nothing in what I've heard from this city council that suggests to me any persuasive evidence that districting is wrong. No, what I've heard is overtly partisan comments, overtly right-wing partisan comments, if I may. There is nothing in districting that inherently is bad, but that's what I'm hearing from you without a shred of evidence. I'm hearing buckets of partisanship. Reconsider this sort of presentation to us. You're all elected in a nonpartisan election. Why it is that you've brought this fairly ugly ordinance into this chamber, into my city, I don't know. I won't make any accusations, but I will tell you that it should be rescinded until we see what's happening in the federal district court, in the Department of Justice against the state of California case, and until we can district and have a city council that's responsive to the various constituencies rather than having, it, having us being roughshod, forced into having this kind of a ordinance that needs desperately to be viewed from all sides, not just one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. 
Um, members of the council, my name is Joel Block, a resident of Rossmore. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. I uh, want to talk about uh, the immigration issue as it reflects on, uh, as it impacts uh, families. Uh, as you are no doubt aware, um, the media are um, full of stories about the new policy that um, has been implemented, resulting in the separation of children from parents. I bring this issue up uh, because of the connection between the same philosophy that I believe um, caused the president to entertain you for political purposes in the White House. Um, the same mentality um, is enacting um, rules that separate parents from children. Um, and that is the mentality of politics. At some point, um, people are gonna start realizing in this council chambers, as well as in the White House, that what in the short term appears to be good politics, in the long term is going to be a footnote in history at most. Um, when we look back 20 years from now, just like we look back at Watergate. I was alive and mature as a human being when Watergate was going on, and I was one of the first people to move that the president resign or be impeached in my central labor council. Um, I was booed down at the time. I was told I was crazy. This was before all the facts had come out, but enough of the facts had come out about the sinister nature of the Nixon administration. Can I ask you something, Joel? So Public comment is to deal with things that are within the jurisdiction of the city council. I have anything to do with the Watergate thing or anything Drawing else like an that, analogy. or even the parent and children being separated at the border. It's a, it's a situation. An well, politics, let's get to the point, because politics, if not, then you need to sit down. Politics drove Nixon to have the plumbers burglarize the Democratic Party headquarters. Politics drove you guys to bring in partisanship into a nonpartisan atmosphere by pushing an ordinance that you should have known and probably did know was illegal. Politics drove you to be invited to the White House. The common thread in everything I've been pointing out to you is that immediate political expediency is not the way to go. It never has been in history. It always is a loser. And the quicker that you realize that the citizens of this city deserve better than just political machinations. Uh, there's lots of ways you could have dealt with uh, your concerns over the California Families Act without passing an ordinance nullifying that law. And now you're going to end up uh, spending the taxpayers' money on it. And it's very unfortunate. Those of us who appreciate good government do not see it here. And that is what I, you asked me last time, why do I keep showing up? Why does Joel Block keep on speaking to the city council of the neighboring jurisdiction? It's about good government. And um, people like Earl Warren, a Republican, was for good government. He was against uh, the political machinations at the time. Throughout history, Eisenhower, similar uh, attitude. It has nothing to do with what party you're at. When you get into political motives, for adopting government policy, you are making a big mistake. And that's all I have to tell you. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Barbara Josephsberg, and I am here, um, I'm a little bit confused. As uh, I, I've listened to how much you support the federal mandates and things over our great state of California, it's a great state that I live in and I believe in. Um, I am, why do you not uh, also uphold the First Amendment in regards to separation of church and state? Why do we have in God we trust above your head? And frankly, I, I'm here because I listened to one of the city council meetings to hear you say after a prayer which started this thing shouldn't be happening. You said in Jesus name, that's very offensive very offensive, not inclusive, it should not be happening. I would really like to see that plaque down and that not happening. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening, Barbara. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Barbara Farrell, and I live in Los Alamitos. I go to church here, and I volunteer here. Before I start, I want to thank Councilman Nusimoto for offering the idea of 10 beds for homeless veterans in many houses. And I think that Los Alamitos should step up and help to improve the homeless issue in Orange County. And I think that's just a wonderful idea. Uh, I am here tonight to ask, oh, first of all, you kind of said that you don't want to talk about uh, the kind, anything but local government. However, you brought yourselves to Washington, D.C. and involved yourself in bigger government. So I think all's fair. Thanks, Joel. Um, I'm here tonight to ask that you reverse the anti-sanctuary ordinance. I could talk about our limited resources for, of law enforcement. I could talk about the waste of our tax dollars on frivolous opposition to the California law. I am talking about our law enforcement community who need or our law enforcement officers who help round who are supposed to now help round up law-abiding immigrants in our churches and schools instead of doing neighborhood policing, a proven method, this ordinance destroys the relationship between the law enforcement officers and our immigrant neighbors. Today, we need sanctuary cities more than ever. The administration of the United States of America whose zero tolerance policies remove special status of Haiti and El Salvadorians who have been here for over 20 years. They canceled DACA, so now we have those people aren't legal anymore either. We have 242,000 young DACA recipients in California, about 130,000 in Orange County. A lot of them are going to schools. We need to protect the DACA kids right here in Los Alamitos. They also decided that everyone coming in over our borders, including asylum seekers, are criminals. We have an asylum law. They're not considered criminals. You come and you talk your case. We need to protect the asylum seekers. They decided that people fleeing domestic violence can't seek asylum. As a woman, I find that atrocious. We need to protect victims of domestic violence. They decided that people fleeing gang violence for their lives could not seek asylum. We need to protect families fleeing gang violence. Finally, they decided to treat asylum seekers, asylum seeking families as criminals and they tear the babies and young children apart from their parents to warehouse them in tent cities and actual warehouses. We need to preserve families even if they are eventually deported. Our faith communities demand it. We need sanctuary more than ever before and we should be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am not going to be speaking about the ordinance. My name is Shelley Henderson. I'm editor of Orange County Breeze, but right at the moment I'm wearing my hat as uh, chairman of the Los Alamitos Chamber of Commerce. I wanted to let everyone know that our next breakfast meeting will be on July 13th in order to uh, avoid the <coughs> July 4th holiday um, confusion. We will be having as a speaker a labor lawyer who will expand and de uh, describe on the recent ruling on uh, independent contractors versus employees. A recent court ruling has made it much more difficult for businesses to use independent contractors. For myself, for instance, I don't know how I can hire a, an independent contractor to design an ad 
for Orange County Breeze because the ruling says that to qualify as an independent contractor, the work that they do has to be substantially different from what is done by the business. Well, we design some ads in-house. How do I distinguish between the in-house advertising design and the independent contractors? Am I going to have to hire an ad designer in addition to what we do? I don't know. So that will be our speaker on July 13th. Anybody who is in business and uses independent contractors should consider attending that meeting. In addition, I am wearing this stylish sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> As part of the advertising for an upcoming event, uh, sponsored jointly by Build It Foundation and by the Los Alamitos Area Chamber of Commerce, it will be held at Laurel Park. It is the first annual Robo Drone Day. We will have drone races. We will have robotics demonstrations. We will have two food trucks so you don't starve to death. Uh, we look to have lots of fun and lots of learning, not just for the folks who come in for the robotics demonstrations and the drones, but for us so that the second annual Robo Drone Day can be bigger and funner. If you are interested in this, you may check the Los Alamitos Chamber website, losalchamber.org for details, or if you happen to have a copy of the Dining Arts and Entertainment Guide for June, which is published by Orange County Breeze, it has details at the center of the publication. Thank you for giving me time. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I've been Laveau, business owner in this beautiful city for 42 years. I want to set the record clear <coughs> that no one on this council invited the Republican women here tonight. The Republican women took it upon themselves to request to present the resolution that they did. Also, you know, I feel like I've got kind of a, a thumb on the pulse of this community. I have heard not one negative thing. I've even had people from other cities that have known me through business send in checks for the GoFundMe for the sanctuary thing. So I just want you to know that, you know, a few people get up and speak and act like, you know, you're blowing it all apart. You're doing great. We love you, and I could bring a bunch of people with me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. Hi there. Mayor. Um, my name is Monica Taramina. I'm an 11-year resident of Los Alamitos. Um, I do not support your opposition to USB 54, and I'm here to welcome you all to a vigil that's being held on the, this Friday, the 20th. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm here to welcome you all to vigil that's being held Friday the 22nd at 5 o'clock at Laurel Park, um, wherein we will be holding a vigil to keep families together because families belong together. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anybody else uh, have anything to add? I'm sure. My name is Robin Istler. I live in Cypress, but I have a, a pet sitting business with my husband, so we're in Los Alamitos all the time. And I just want to thank the city council. I'm embarrassed that Cyprus hasn't done it. And I want to thank you for <laughs> taking the initiative because it always takes one to start something and you started something really good that's going to be better in the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> with that I'm going to go ahead and uh, close oral communications and uh, we're going to move on to uh, council announcements. Uh, council Member Turco. Sure. Um, I was uh, fortunate to participate in the last month in the hotel groundbreaking on Los Alamitos Boulevard, which was great. It was my first time participating in one of those. Um, attended the uh, budget standing committee meeting where we finalized the budget. Um, a couple of public hearings regarding the change to voting districts. Um, and I'm looking forward to participating in the CERB Los Al event June 29th through 30th, um, where um, you know the whole community will be or a lot of people in the community will be volunteering. Um, and then we've also got the 4th of July fireworks spectacular coming up on uh, 4th of July, of course, um, at the <coughs> Joint Forces Training Base. Mm, okay. Um, Thank you. Councilmember Murphy. Hey, Chief, uh, I want to make sure everything is okay out there. 
or somebody? Okay, so Councilmember Murphy. Okay, you know, I thought I'd been to a bunch of meetings. It turned out they were all redistricting meetings. So, <laughs> um, I did attend the POA, which is always a great event, and we have to thank the Brew House uh, and George. You know, George always comes <coughs> up with something. He knighted two of our more illustrious citizens at this last meeting, Kenny Brandeberry and John Osborne, for their great works in the community over all these years. So they are now officially Los Alamitos Sirs, according to the POA. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the, the, the school district. They invited us to the Los Al High School graduation, and my first thought was, oh my God, it's hot, and I'm wearing this polyester robe. Uh, this thing was fantastic. Uh, they, the use of the unbelievably talented choir to uh, bring a liveliness to it, uh, it really, it, it was two hours, and there's a lot of grad, over 800 graduates. It took quite a while to give them out, but uh, it was it was really fun. And uh, you know, I think that's part of Sherry Croft's uh, genius is is that uh, she keeps it fun and keeps the energy going all the time. Um, also, was able to attend the hotel groundbreaking and happy that they're getting started and, and seeing fit to to invest in our community. I think it's a very positive sign. Uh, Troy has mentioned this several times, but you know our job as a city is to build the infrastructure and kind of build it, and they will come. And we're seeing that, which is very good for an older city that that needs to turn over in a lot of a lot of areas. And glad to see we're making great progress. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councilmember Hasselberry. Um, I attended the chamber breakfast in June um, over at Griffin's Grill. Um, I did attend the hotel groundbreaking. Got to dig my first hole with a gold shovel. That was pretty cool. Um, attended the uh, Sunburst graduation uh, two weeks ago over at Cottonwood Church. Um, you know, the Sunburst program is, is an amazing program that's held over at the uh, Joint Forces Training Base. They take approximately 200 kids voluntarily um, for a 22-week resident program and um, start them over again. And these kids are graduating from high school. They're getting caught up in high school. Um, they're just taught all kinds of skills to live and they're turned into productive human beings and this is funded by the federal government and um, it's just it's a great program in our backyard and I was very excited um, I do want to make sure because we normally have a tradition that we have the Sunburst Student Council come um, the month before they graduate to do the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, kind of present them as well it's I know it's a really big deal to them and we didn't do it this year so I just want to make sure that we stick that on our November meeting for the December graduation and also on the May meeting for the June graduation. We, um, we had reached out to them in advance, so, and Wendy, do you have any anything to add to that? We did reach out ahead of time. Yeah, just what uh, Brett said, they had sent us a list of the graduating class for to prepare the certificates, and we reached out to see if they would like to come to a council meeting, and there was no follow-up. Okay. on their end I'll we'll probably, do it again for the I'll, next I'll probably nag him a little bit because that means a big deal to the kids I mean they stand up behind us they're part of our council and that's a that's a really big deal and I don't want the tradition to go away just because they're not responsive um, so I'll, I'll make sure that I stay on it as well um, <clears throat> did attend the high school graduation in my steamy hot robe as well um, you know we had the high school principal serenading us with his acoustic guitar and the choir is his doo-wop girls uh, which was just amazing uh, we had three graduates that are going on to military academies they said it's unheard of even to have one at a high school but we had three this year we also had 17 enlisting um, in the various branches of, of the military which is great we had 11 valedictorians that um, boasted a 4.5 GPA or better um, so pretty pretty demanding stats um, I'd like to thank the school district for just including us. They invited uh, the city of Seal Beach, Rossmore, and us to participate in it, sit on stage. We got to move diplomas around and shake hands with, with kids that we've known since they were in diapers. So it was as much of a thrill for, for me as it was for the graduates. Um, and I do want to remind everybody that uh, our first movie in the park is this coming Saturday night. It's going to be at Laurel Park. It's going to be Lion King. Uh, it starts at 6.30 with the live band Reckless, which is classic rock for our old farts. That's probably a good thing. And there's going to be food, and the movie starts at dusk, so it's free entertainment. 
and I just want to make sure you know it's going to be a hot weekend and to be able to sit out there at one of our local parks and listen to some music eat some great food and, and watch a movie you can't get better than that and with that back good to deal you. thank you mayor pro tem thank you so uh, only a couple of things the uh, west cities uh, west cities com um the jpa that i'm part of i attended the special meeting but i missed one of them as well but we have a meeting tomorrow um the uh, low cell zoning uh, code update committee i attended that and then i also attended the uh, hearing uh one of the hearing so the first public hearing on the redistricting so with that um back to you mayor um, yeah, the hotel groundbreaking was uh, really, for me, something that uh, I was really excited about. You know, we put uh, about 10 years into getting Los Alamitos Boulevard uh, kind of infrastructure ready, and to see the investment out there and the actually breaking ground was really exciting. I uh, wanted to thank the developer and uh, the Public Works Department, too, for uh, working with them and help them get through that process. And uh, in a year, uh, there'll be a new structure there. And, uh, and I know from a budget subcommittee, they're depending on that revenue within a year. So. I'm hoping uh, you guys will keep that on track. Um, the 4th of July, just uh, continue to remind uh, everybody in the community, it's a partnership with uh, Cypress, mm -hmm. uh, Los Alamitos, Seal Beach, Rossmore, um, and, uh, and and obviously the base. Uh, you know, we did the signing for that uh, two or three weeks ago with uh, Colonel Bond from the base. Uh, it's a really big deal. And uh, last year we had anywhere between 15 to 20,000 people out there. So uh, you know, we're looking forward to that. Um, I wanted to thank President uh, Barkey, or Dr. Barkey, there on the uh, Los Alamitos Unified School District and uh, and his uh, board of directors and also uh, S uh, Superintendent Sh uh, Dr. Sherry Kropp, um, you know, echoing everything that was set up here. Uh, you know, just uh, after watching three graduations uh, with my boys working their way through Los Al High, to actually uh, sit up uh, on stage and uh, to be able to, to have that experience. And, uh, you know, it was really the uh, school board, uh, you know, showing partnership and their view of it takes a village. So I, I just, again, wanted to thank the uh, Los Alamitos Unified School District uh, for the partnership. A um, couple other meetings, the uh, Serve Los Al, I think um, Councilmember Churko had talked about that June 30th. It's, uh, it's going to be an event at the community center and uh, for some of us that have been around for a while um, it's kind of interesting so I, I really have high hopes for the uh, for that you know we used to have a solution a partnership for solutions that which uh, really tried to kind of get all the charities to work together and um, you know since uh, most of us on the uh, council are very involved with a lot of the charities I'm, I'm excited to see now where we're trying it again and uh, got a lot of fresh faces on that and I think it's gonna be a great opportunity for everybody to work together um, so uh, with that I'm going to go ahead and uh, close uh, council announcements and uh, items from the city manager. Um, the council has hit on all three items that I wrote down, but I, I was going to ask Ron to give an update on all the 4th of July, Serve Los Al, and movie and music in the part. I think everything has pretty much been covered. Anything else you want to highlight, Ron? No. Good evening, Mayor City Council. No, you guys, you guys are pretty awesome up there but uh let's let's take one like uh, um city council member um Hasselbrink said we have music and movies our first one saturday uh it's at laurel park but we also have two others the dates are let me look at my notes here uh july 14th at oral lewis the movie will be coco and the band is la serena it's a latin band and then the last one for the summer is on july 28th at little cottonwood park and that's a Lego Ninjago movie, and the band is Sugar Lips. So um, all the information I'm going to say is also on our website, so go visit our website. But like she said, movie uh, band starts at 6.30. Movie starts around dusk, around 7.45, 8 o'clock. The second one, of course, is uh, Serve La Salle. We're really, really excited about that. That's on June 29th and 30th. We have a assembly scheduled at the Community Center parking lot. That's on Oak Street at 8 a.m. On, on Saturday. And um, I encourage the community to come out. Um, we have all the nonprofits out there. They're going to have booth talking about their nonprofit. OCFA will be out there as well. And um, if you haven't signed up for a service project, go visit um, www.servelosal.org uh, to sign up for a community service project for either a Friday night or a Saturday uh, morning. And right now, we're close to 200 volunteers for that day. So we're really excited about that. And then, of course, we have the 4th of July. Um, it's over on the Joint Forces Training Base. And that um, event begins at 4 p.m. Um, parking is on the base. We do not charge for parking. It's a free entrance. And uh, the fireworks show starts at 9. Uh, the 
one of the things that we're excited about is uh, we're working with the military and they have agreed to do a fun area. So we can't have the inflatables like we've done in the past, but we can do family style games such as um, we're going to have like a pie eating contest. We're going to have um, face painting. We're going to have um, balloon twisting um, for the kids. So there's some fun activities for the families to do that's not inflatable um, or bounce houses type stuff. So come on out for either of the events again. Visit the city's website and uh, you can get more information on there. Thank uh, you. Ron, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, we have the race series that uh, we basically have the race on the base, and then the next stop in the race series is in Cyprus. So can you talk a little bit about that uh, coming up in July? Yes. Yeah, so the city of Cyprus has their um, community race. That's, I don't know the exact date, but it's in the end of July. And um, it's part of the race series with the three events. So the race on the base in Los Alamitos to Cypress 5K and the Seal Beach 5K as well. So if you do all three of those events, you get a really, really cool medal. Um, yeah. And uh, if you're a racer and you're a participant, then that's the thing to do. The medal's quite large and it's a- uh, Very large. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a very nice medal. So uh, yeah. again, you can start at any of the events. You don't have to start out race on the base, which is in February. You could start at the one in Cyprus again in July. Then you could, the next one would be race on the base in February and then the one of Seal Beach, which is I believe in March. So, yeah. so it's July 28th, okay. and uh, yeah, so they also have a big pancake breakfast over there, really fun, a uh, little festival, chili cook-off, all that. So uh, definitely uh, by supporting them, you're supporting uh, Los Alamitos, too, because uh, they basically help us uh, draw people in for our race, too. So Correct. thank you. Uh, the one last thing I guess I had as a question maybe for one of you two was the um, uh, on the bike trail that we paved. Um, I noticed that now both sides of the bike trail have been repaved by somebody else. I was just kind of curious if we knew, um, if, if we were familiar with whether the flood control districts saw what we did and then kind of jumped in. That's right, LA County did pave the other side for their maintenance trucks. Wow. We couldn't get them to pave our side for their maintenance truck, uh -uh. but they painted their, uh, you know, paved theirs. Yeah, I was, uh, it was interesting. I was uh, running out there and I noticed that it was, and it's not striped, or will they stripe it to match all the work that we did? No, hmm. because it's not considered a bike path. It's only a maintenance area. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, too bad. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, pretty interesting to uh, to see. Also, uh, the, 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 a lot of people were calling too about uh, the graffiti. Just wanted to make sure if you guys, uh, you know, want to keep an eye on that down there, especially under the bridge. Uh, is there anything else uh, from staff? No, sir. All righty. Um, now we'll move on to warrants. Um, can I get a motion for the warrants? I'll move. Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote. Mayor Edgar? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Kusumoto? Aye. Council Member Cherko? Aye. Council Member Hasselbrink? Aye. Council <coughs> Member Murphy? Aye. All righty. Uh, consent calendar. All consent calendar items can be voted upon a, by one motion unless the council member requests separate action on an item. Does anybody uh, wish to pull anything off of uh, the consent calendar? No. If uh, nobody does, can I get a motion to uh, move the consent calendar? Motion to move. Second. All right. All in favor to move the consent calendar? Aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> um, hey, uh, Marilyn, within the uh, consent calendar, I just didn't know if uh, we di did uh, have the item on there for the uh, uh, museum. I, I didn't know if there was anything else that you wanted to cover. Okay. Cause, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay, uh, next up here is public hearings. The adoption, uh, this is 11A, the adoption of the City of Los Alamitos fiscal year 2018-19 annual operating and capital improvement program budget. Uh, city Manager. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, this is the last step in the bu budget process for fiscal year 2018-2019, <coughs> and we have gone through ad a number of meetings with both the Budget Standing Committee and the full City Council. And um, we can, I will have the Interim Administrative Services Director, Maria Luisa Valdez, do a presentation and answer any questions that you may have. Great. Hi there. Yeah, please. So yeah, presented for your consideration is the 2018-19 Annual Operating and Capital Improvement Program Budget for the City of Los Alamitos. We are happy to present a balanced budget and it's attachment one and two of the staff report. We were able to close down the budget gap that was reported in our preliminary budget workshop in March. We reported a gap of 102,830. 
We incorporated the new hotel development revenue in the budget along with reducing the operating budget for $24,000 for the Fenley pump station. And the third thing to incorporate to close the budget is the, uh, is the increase in business licenses of $16,000. So we are reporting a surplus of $10,470. I would like to highlight that we haven't included the additional revenues associated with the user fee study and the suggested CPI increase, which we'll go over next in the public hearing. And the budget does, however, incorporate the recommendations approved in the organizational study approved by City Council on May 11, 2018. So there will be no changes in the budget for that in incorporation for that fiscal impact. Great. Additionally, the budget includes annual dues for memberships as part of our budget process. We've um, discussed the Association of California Cities, Orange County. So if the City Council determines not to renew the annual dues, the general fund surplus will increase slightly for that 6835 So we're seeking direction in this staff report as well to proceed with the membership and payment in regards to ACCOC. So that's it for the operating budget. As lastly, as part of the capital budget, the council we discussed at our last budget workshop, we've incorporated all the capital projects and we still have a balanced budget at the end of the day for our capital improvement program. We have a lot of projects that will benefit the entire community. We have the Fenley pump station, the generator, safety around the police department, like security cameras and the bulletproof um, window and wall that were all discussed last month. But um, really a lot of key projects that are good for the city and really benefit the whole community. And with that, I would like to just comment that um, like to, um, due to a lack of quorum, the budget standing committee was not able to meet, but we did meet with each staff member individually so they can comment on any, um, you know, it was a group effort and like they really directed us to close the budget gap. So they're available for any questions and so am I here. Good deal. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring it back. I'm going to hear from the Budget Subcommittee and then I'm going to open up for public hearing. Um, so uh, if I could, uh, Councilmember Hasselbrink or Councilmember Sherko, could you give your perspective uh, for the community as they watch right. this? Um, you know, usually the budget is a big drawn out thing. The end, it's a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities and stuff. But I think if anybody's been following this, you guys have been doing a great job of going through these budget subcommittees. We've been having a ton of meetings, so this seems a little anticlimactic at the end, but we, uh, the council would very much appreciate your perspective as you guys have been the closest to it, and I'd just like to hear from both of you. Okay, I'll, I'll be real brief. I don't want to steal all of Mark's thunder as I technically try to do. Um, you know, this year was interesting. Um, we were brand new on this budget and finance committee, and we kind of sat in there going, all right, where do we start? And staff kind of led us down this path. Um, really so it's great um, she's also new so we were just kind of looking at each other going all right we're let's balance this thing and you know I've got to say all the departments really stepped up uh, they brought in some cost savings without cutting any services without cutting um, eliminating existing people um, and that really played into it it was definitely a group effort we got a little creative we were able to cut some things that uh, weren't really necessary and now we're going to be able to redo Labradette Park with brand new playground equipment for to replace the 20 year old equipment. Uh, to me that's great for the community, that's great for our apartment row in that area, that is their closest little park. It's a park my boys went to every Saturday so I'm, I'm very happy to see that happen and um, you know this was a great experience. Uh, we got into a hundred dollars here and five hundred dollars there and just asking questions and staff always had the answers and I'm just confident this budget is is sound and good and realistic and um, will stay balanced throughout the year. Good deal. Thank you. Councilmember Churko. Sure. So uh, I know we up here like to take credit a lot, a lot of times for things that happen. Well, mostly you four <laughs> like to take credit. Um, All righty. I'm joking. Um, but kind of. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, you know we would go to these budget meetings and uh, seriously the staff had everything ready and directed us and we just asked a few questions here and there but um, but thankfully they, they did such a great job sort of guiding us through the process since it was our first time um, and so they did all the heavy lifting um, for sure so um, I'm I'm comfortable with it I mean the one there is one area where. Um, you know, I, our, our estimates don't really take into account attorney fees and um, uh, all we've got going on with the voting, um, switching to voting districts, uh, the lawsuit, um, all of that. So it's something that we should definitely um, keep an eye on and, and do what we can to keep our expenses down. Um, 
because if you look at, for example, 2017-2018 budget, we're already, um, if you include this month's warrants, we're $146,000 over budget just on attorney fees. Um, so that's some, you know, I, I deal with this at work every day, reviewing um, attorney bills, and so it's something, of course, I focus on, um, but it's just something that we need to keep in mind going forward. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and open it up to a uh, public hearing. Anybody have any comments or feedback? We'd appreciate it. Hi there. I'm back. Uh, Shelly Henderson, I'm here again as chairman of the Los Alamitos uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I was listening to uh, her fine explanation of how she closed the gap. They closed. I shouldn't just put it on her. Um, and two things caught my attention. One was an increase in business licenses, so I have to ask for, if possible, an expansion of that. Uh, how are you increasing the income and <coughs> business licenses? And then the other thing was, you're depending on the hotel opening. When is it expected to open? I think we're charging Shelley's business the, the <laughs> difference, yeah. right? That's all from her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only if each of you takes out an ad. <laughs> Oh, that's, I'll do that if it's that's all it is. Year. Yeah, it's I'm in. Year. Everybody will be taking yeah. out of it. So, uh, yeah, can we address those two questions, please? Thank you. So for the business licenses, we had in March had a preliminary budget, and we had incorporated last year there was a CPI of about 1.7%. Now, conservatively, we for 18, 19, we estimated that it would be at 1% as well. However, due to the CPI that we, well, we were able to get uh, retrieve from the Department of Labor, they it's actually at 3.7%. So we applied that, and that's the actual amount. So it's not like we agreed it. It's actually in our muni code where we have that percentage, and we apply that to the business licenses. And second, um, so it's not, we didn't make that decision. It's, it's in our muni code. As far as the new hotel development, although it's uncertain at this point, um, we're thinking in an aggressive development that it would still open April 1st, 2019. That's pretty, yeah, that's what we've okay. incorporated. So April 1st is the answer and it's uh, no more, we're not forecasting extra businesses joining up, which is I think where Shelly was going, but it's it's the increase in the fees across the, the same. Yeah, increase, yeah. yes. And, okay. and the budget will change, continues to change, but mm -hmm. um, with the hotel development, it still would be April 1st, 2000. And, and just to add to that, we um, did talk to the Budget Standing Committee and into the council as a whole about alternative budget gap closures if the hotel does not open as originally anticipated on April 1st of mm -hmm. 2019. So um, there are additional offsets that we kind of have potentially in our back pocket, mm -hmm. and we would bring that up at the with the Budget Standing Committee and with the council at mid-year okay. next year. Good deal. Thank you. I, Barbara. I just want to, yeah, I'm Barbara Farrell again. <clears throat> I just want to thank you for addressing Little Cottonwood Park. It serves the apartment row residents and it will serve them better. There's a lot of young mothers that I see going up and down Farquhar and uh, in the early part of the day or in the later part, not when the Englishmen are out there getting burned up. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. And then it's Labradet Park that's in the budget for 1819. It's in the CIP. No, Labradet. It's, it's Labradet Park. They have 20 year old playground equipment, and so we're going to be replacing that along with the rubberized, um, replacing the sand with the rubberized surfacing. Surf there you go. Okay. Uh, anybody else in the public? Yeah, come on up. Um, I just want to say that I, I, you know, Ms. Hasselbrinks indicated that I'm not familiar with all of what you guys are discussing with regard to the park. Sure. But to me, it's a shame that I'm hearing, you know, Mr. Cherico say we need to, you know, be fiscally conservative and watch the budget because of how much money you're spending in attorney's fees and so forth. With regard to, you know, he doesn't necessarily support all of what is going on with the park or what's proposed so it's just shameful because this hurts our community and we're spending money on on issues that you indicated mr Edgar, that aren't in, that immigrants aren't an issue in los alamitos so this is one of the biggest concerns to us um that you know don't support your opposition to sb 54 
it's just troubling to see that how much money is going towards something that doesn't it's, it's not the main issue and the community is being hurt because of it so from mm. a fiscally you know from a fiscal perspective so that's all can I ask you a question so um, d do you know how much of our budget we spend on police I yeah, don't, I so don't we have spend. So j just to give you an idea, so that you get an idea, because since you've said specifically me, fifty-five percent of our budget goes towards police. Okay. And so the sanctuary law thing is not about being anti-immigrant; it's about control of our police department. And, and I'm just giving you. I mean, we can differ on that, but I just wanted to give you a perspective. So to me. I want to be able to make sure that whatever future council is up here, they have complete control over their police department that us as residents and you pay for. So really, to me, it's worth every single dollar that we spend legally to defend that right. And okay. I just, no, but I'm just letting you know, because I think it, it's got to be a balance. It's not a one-way dialogue of just everybody continues to kind of have their perspective. I think you need to make sure that you at least consider for a bit what, what the perspective of the, at least four of us up here was. Sure, but I would, again, I would say that that's up the federal agencies should take care of the issues that federal agents are going to act out okay so um, but again I'm hearing him you know voice his concern so it's a concern to me so, yeah. as a resident of Los Alamitos and as a mother okay thank you if there's no other uh, comment uh, bring it back up here um, so anybody else uh, Councilmember Murphy yeah, you know, somebody mentioned anticlimactic, and I want to say that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, my first meeting when we did the budget, we didn't have any of these preparation meetings. We just showed up, and the wool flew, and it was, as, as a former CPA, I was horrified. In fact, something that Troy had been against and been outvoted four to one for $375,000 but he lost the issue in May, but in June, since that was our budget deficit, we just threw it out. We said, okay, the balanced budget now. We'd spent two hours debating the garage issue it was, mm -hmm. and yet we, we completely turned around just because we needed to fill the hole, and people threw in their pet projects. And I, at the time, I really said never again. And I wanna thank, first of all, my colleagues for allowing the time it takes. We spend a lot of time. I'm, I'm proud when I tell other cities what we do on the budget. You know, we. We beat it to death, and the committee, you know, I know how much time it takes, but it really is, it really is a powerful position, and I applaud you both. It was a, a great job. Yeah. Brett and Maria Luisa also, you know, Brett was the one who brought this to the city, the, the um, structure of starting way back in February. You know, it's, uh, I think the way we, we budget is, is incredible, and the amount of time we spend is, is reflected, and it, you know, it's, Troy and I have both said now, you look at that 10-year projection, and I know once we get past this, that's going to become the next big issue. Hopefully it doesn't get overshadowed by the immigration issue. The, the, the next 10 years, it's going, to be, it's going to be wild and woolly up here for, uh, for balancing that budget. And as those pension costs keep increasing, we're going to need to be ever vigilant and eventually take a stand somewhere. And I think uh, Troy mentioned bringing educating starting to educate the public about what 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 our problem is and what our possible solutions are because there's there's the problem's pretty simple and the solutions are not easy but there's not that many of them so we can select one and and, and move on thank you thank you Mayor Pro Tem. Make, uh, yeah uh, thanks to Maria Luisa and all the staff for all of your hard work on putting the budget together and the budget standing committee um, did a lot of really hard work and I'm so I also want to thank the full council for as council member Murphy mentions um, creating that budget standing committee almost five years ago now and all the work that you guys have done it's been for staff a fantastic tool and I think mm. the council as well so thank mm -hmm. you for your support cool. thank you uh, mayor pro Tim Kismano sure and I'll, I'll kind of echo some of that uh, past history I know on the uh, budget I know what Richard speaks of and um, I have to say you know we we're uh, not well cohesive as a council back then, and I know that uh, you know the finance uh, director that had been hired by your predecessor came on board, did the best he could, and in the blind through something you know uh, delivered a product that was very difficult for us to really comprehend in a very short time. So I think this process, you know, with the workshops and everything, has been just a really good process to um, 
incrementally provide all these uh, different insights. And I think some of the restructuring that has happened, I know the garage fund has been a <laughs> discussion for many, many, many times. Um, I guess one question I do have um, for the city attorney, um, we have more than just two lawsuits, right? I mean, we have, we're sued for, there was a fatality on Coyote Bridge, uh, and I think both parties are suing us. There were some other, um, I, can you, uh, rough, in rough terms, how many lawsuits are kind of, we're being sued, uh, you know, about now? It's, it's, I want to say less, around five, does that sound about right? Handful, uh, right? There's a distinction to be drawn between claims that have been filed with the city and actual <laughs> initiated litigation. So as, as far as, lawsuits that my firm for example are handling there is one okay um and then i think uh the coyote creek would be the other active litigation case right. at this point in time but, that, but, the, but the city claims. the city's getting sued i mean right in, in that one correct by the um survivors of that uh the um you know the uh whatever victim of that accident and then even the perpetrator of the accident is also suing us <coughs> Christ, right so th there's a lot of lawsuits that are going on uh, for whatever reason, you know, people trip and they sue us. So uh, I, I think to uh, Council Member Churko's uh, admonition about watching that, yeah, those are things that are just going to happen to us, and they do happen, unfortunately, because um, there are cities and, and counties that are viewed as deep pockets um, that have insurance uh, uh, that uh, makes us just a target for litigation. So we have to watch that, but, you know, there are things that are going to be beyond our control. So, um, But I think uh, with respect to this, um, the... Uh, the one thing I do like is the Fenley pump station that's near and dear to uh, my neighborhood. So I know it's, uh, we don't want that to fail. I'll, I'll tell you, um, back in 1995 in my old neighborhood, that pump failed and I had uh, a foot of water in my garage. And uh, luckily the house was on a raised foundation and we didn't suffer any damage there. So yes, please, <coughs> um, you know, that's a good thing. And then the, the generator here for emergency services, I think that's been a long standing need and I'm glad we're able to finally get that going. So with that, uh, back to you, Mayor, thank you. Yeah, um, any other comments from the, uh, from the ad hoc committee at this point? No. Okay. Yeah. So, kind of in closing, uh, I, it seemed like there was a question to be posed with the ACCOC. D d is that uh, is that a done deal, or is that because I think it sounds like you need direction on that? Yeah, we we included uh, in the staff report an item on ACCOC that had been brought up, um, I think, at one time by the standing committee and by the council as a whole. So, mm -hmm. we wanted to provide the forum for discussion. Yeah. Um, we haven't paid the dues for this fiscal year and so it's about as Maria Luisa said about sixty eight hundred dollars so we that's that was the purpose for including it in there and then we just we did also ask for council direction on that item if you want to stay as a member or not that's basically okay. the question. so that'll be an item we'll have a separate vote for yes okay um, so a couple things so uh, this is my last budget so I just want to kind of give you a couple things to think about um, kind of down the road um, Definitely keep an eye on the garage fund. I, uh, I, I, I we changed the title of that, yeah. by the way. Vehicles it's the yeah. Vehicle and Equipment Replacement yeah. Fund. If we could just so get that out there. In public. the community, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you guys start seeing a lot of new police cars and utility trucks and all that, keep an eye on that because uh, the chief came in, definitely got that squared away under police. So we've been trying to be very prudent uh, looking at leasing versus uh, buying stuff outright. Um, but, but I think that that problematic uh, area, or at least for historically problematic, ended up being an area we would accumulate a lot of money. Uh, in lean years, we would really take it from there if we were really short. And then in the other years, uh, we would just sit on it and it would build and we wouldn't replenish the cars and we'd end up paying a piper at the very end. So the other one is the, uh, what I'll call ISFs or the uh, s special funds. And so there's probably 12 or 13 special funds in the city. Um, they basically get funded through different things like uh, gas tax, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know the way that it, that it was set up in the beginning is that that m money kind of got pushed flat across, and it was hard to kind of keep track. And I think the city's done a great job of now making it a visible kind of a portfolio that we can actually see where all the money is at. And then um, you know with districts coming into play, I really you know and again I I'm not piling on. The hardest part I've had as being a city council member. 
um, was to be a team player when it came to stuff that you really wanted to fight for versus where the money was. And so you take into effect, for example, to get certain roads done, but uh, you maybe have a road or even an alley that's in a hotel or the apartment area, you might be able to get some money from one group, like CDBG money from the, the county, then you kind of go through and you have to piece all this together. So I think uh, you know this finance position is gonna be so critical to try and help this new formed council that's gonna be district-based make better holistic decisions because again this is unavoidable and um, you know and I think that again I, 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 I hope that uh, you guys continue to do that um, th the last thing I would talk about is um, a bigger picture has to do with the structural deficit problem that we're gonna have five to ten years from now because uh, as Councilmember Murphy said, this this is definitely something, you know, I, I, I talk about this and I'm absolutely not for it, but I, I will tell you at some point we are going to have to address, um, there's not new revenue sources. You know, I think Shelly Henderson, she asked the question about the business licenses because I know what the answer she wanted. Oh my God, there's so many new businesses coming in, so it must be new licenses. And so the chamber ears, ears pop, pure, you know, hey, uh, that means more people are going to join the chamber. But the reality is we're living off of rate increases. Um, you know, or, you know, increase fees and, uh, you know, which means eventually there's two or three areas that we're going to have to start to take into consideration. Again, I'll be long gone. The first area is sales tax is we've got to take a look at that and know that at a point of time, if that becomes a desperate move, that's two to three million dollars more a year that we would get if we had to do something like that. And God forbid we have to. But, you know, unless something really miraculously happens, we've got a fixed math equation that doesn't have a lot of move for um, structural change. Uh, the second area is utility users taxes. So, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, telecommunications, uh, which we lowered in one year, I measure DD in 2012. Um, but if you look, just for an example, for like uh, electric, uh, you know, the, uh, for that tax, you know, Seal Beach somewhere around 12%, we're somewhere around 6%. Um, most cities are more towards 10% and above. I'm not advocating again for taxes, but I'm just putting it out there since I have no horse in this race coming up is that uh, that's good for another six to in eight, six to nine hundred thousand dollars per utility tax if it's addressed and gone through the process and so something that future councils might want to consider is that if something does get to a point of desperation um, and we go through that you know put it to the people you know don't make that something that we have to make a, a decision up here but allow the voters to weigh in when the services start to become a point that it's untenable when the first thing that goes away is going to be our ability to have parks and recreation programs because we're going to try and preserve the police and fill potholes. Um, the quality of life starts going down when the senior citizen uh, senior center does not have or provide food services for the seniors anymore, and they're sitting over there and they really wanted to be able to be taken care of. Uh, or you know, you go and you look at the parks and they're not going to be kind of t taken care of anymore either. You know, when you talk about Little Cottonwood, which is a really critical park, which I I actually agree with Miss Farrell. Definitely definitely needs an investment, but it's it's a math equation. So uh, again, uh, I'm not advocating for tax increases, but I'd, uh, uh, with complete dire circumstances as it pertains structurally leading ahead, I have been on for 12 years, I don't see mathematical fixes coming in the next five to 10 years, and eventually somebody's gonna have to take on the hard decision of looking at taxes. You know, to address your issue, and I, I really apologize, I don't mean to be confrontational or aggressive when it comes to our legal fees and what's going into account for the sanctuary thing, but this will pass and it'll come in time. But, but the reality is that, you know, the other cushion that the community to be aware of is that we've got uh, you know a, a, a basically a, a general fund surplus of eight million dollars approximately 78 million that we would be able to um, harbor through good and bad in 2009-10 with that eight million dollars started being used at four to six hundred thousand dollars a year uh, because we were having a downturn in business and we ended up getting that down to almost 3.8 million and then this council with the leadership of everybody up here definitely was able to get this back up to being a healthy reserve and you know to answer the question and again of one of five we are not going to spend eight million dollars on any sort of a lawsuit we i think we have definitely um, a level of control and self-discipline and being able to go through this and I've said all along that you know we'll do this ACLU lawsuit until it does not make prudent sense and every time we're evaluating whether where we're at where this thing needs to go 
So, um, you know, I would just say, you know, for the community, if anybody's out there and they, you know, with Councilmember Churko, I think makes a valid point. And you don't see us fighting him on that. I mean, he is the, the balance of our council. He's the person that, uh, you know, through this process, even though we voted for one on the sanctuary thing, I would have to say that Councilmember Churko has been a very fair player through this process and has also provided us council and we continue to respect and appreciate it. Uh, but for, for the budget, like I said, I, I, I'm really, really concerned structurally five to ten years from now um, if you look at what happens in La Palma you look at what happens in Westminster you look at what happened in Fountain Valley they all came to the reality that they had to address this through a tax increase um, and it's not something but you know to be honest look at our police staffing look at our you know how we're starting to now put together solutions at the end here we are holding off on hiring people we've now don't have a parks and recreation director anymore we've combined it into two managers these two managers, Emlyn and Ron, are going to kick butt. The community's going to love it. But you know what? For 30, 50 years, 40 years at least, we've had a structure with a fully staffed executive team uh, that, you know, we're going to have to give this a try. Uh, like I said, I, I only reason I'm putting this out there is we are doing in real time exactly what the community needs us to do, which is to make the hard decisions. But there is going to come a time, probably in about two and a half, three years, where we're going to have to make some really big decisions. And I hope the council starts this PR thing so it's not a shocker when we sit back. Because in Fountain Valley, it was a shocker, you know. And Westminster was absolutely a shocker, and it was misinterpreted. And they were on their way to bankruptcy. You know, La Palma lost, uh, you know, I, so I think that I just, uh, I would leave us with this. I really appreciate all the work. Um, we know we've all had an opportunity to be on the um, budget uh, ad hoc committee. Um, uh, Jeff, or uh, Jeff, there was a slip, huh? <laughs> Brett, <laughs> yeah, 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 another city manager. Uh, but uh, Brad, I, I would also say again, um, as I'm kind of closing out uh, my final pit with this budget, I just really appreciate everything that you've done to uh, show the leadership through the transition, bringing in the interim folks. So, you know, I hope that um, you yeah, know for a longer term permanent solution for how we're going to deal with a lot of these things. But I, I really appreciate it. Um, with that, um, two things I'd like to kind of bifurcate these and take them in separate order because I, I want to make sure the first item uh, council member house break I'd like to talk a little bit about the ACCOC it, we don't have to talk about it if we want to just put a motion out there on the floor and entertain a second and then from there we can go I would that might be more effective but um, do you have any preference on where to go no, I'll give a little bit of background um, you know I came in on the council almost four years ago um, and there was a question there of whether we were going to continue our membership as ACCOC and I committed at that time that I would actively go to the functions, um, participate in as much as that I could. Um, and I did for quite some time. Um, they've had some change in leadership, um, some change in services, and I'm not, at this point, I'm not quite seeing the bang for our buck. Uh, we pay more for those dues than we do for League of California Cities. League of California Cities is a statewide organization um, that's located literally across the street from the Capitol. Uh, they have a very, very loud voice um, up in Sacramento. Um, ACCOC is great for Orange County. Some of the things that I've seen them doing um, is not in favor of local control, and I was a little bit concerned about that. Uh, the other thing is one of their tools that they used to have, which was great, was a legislative tracker. And so at the beginning of every legislative year, um, about 2,200 bills are introduced uh, between the Assembly and the Senate. And for us to comb through those to see what's relevant to us, not enough time in the day uh, and so they would put together for each city a legislative tracker that would they would identify uh, these bills that were relevant either to our region or to our city or just to our quality of life and we would be able to track those on on their website um, to see where they were to see when we need to send letters of support or letters of opposition that tool hasn't been I don't know if it's not available. It hasn't certainly hasn't been marketed in the last couple of years. Um, most of their events now, there is a cost to go to, even though we're paying a cost to be a member. Um, most of their events are on a Thursday, Friday from 9 to 1. All of us here have full-time, well, except for Richard, full-time paying jobs. <laughs> You're just jealous. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. And so, you know, and we really try to represent ourselves throughout the county, and I think we all do a really good job up here. So, you know, $6,800 isn't a lot, but if we're not getting anything out of it, um, I'd rather just uh, cut our ties and, and concentrate on things that we are ha having an impact on where we are learning things. 
um, in, in helping make our, our county and our city better. Would, would you like to put a motion on the table? We'll see if I can get a second, and then we'll just <coughs> see if anybody else has any comments, because I want to solve that first. Okay. I'm sure I, I would like to make a motion that we discontinue our membership with ACCOC. Okay. Is there a second on the floor? I'll go ahead and second, just for the purpose of having the discussion. Okay. Uh, anybody else uh, like to make a comment specifically on the membership for ACCOC? Um, yeah. In general, on our memberships, I remember a staff report a few years ago, we laid out all the dues we paid. And I'd like to suggest we do that for the next meeting and um, give the benefits of those, give the benefits of each one, and then make a decision in July, if that's all right with my colleagues. Okay. Anybody else have any comment? I, I, I do have some, I have a, definitely a perspective on this. And, and I think when you alluded to some of the really difficult economic times, this was on the table, SCAG, the Southern California Association of Governments membership was, and even the League of Cities. But I think a little bit of a historical perspective on ACCOC, as, as I can understand it, and maybe uh, Mayor Edgar, you can kind of fill in some of my, you know, maybe, you know, misrecollections. But um, ACCOC came into being after the kind of the uh, dissolution of the Orange County chapter of the League of Cities. Um, which was in place and we were actually paying dual dues. We were paying dues to the League of Cities and we were also paying the same amount of dues to the Orange County chapter of the League of Cities. And, and in a way, they kind of acted as that function that uh, Councilmember Hasselbrink uh, talked about. And they still do that today. I think I still see the emails from uh, uh, the Orange County's uh, rep uh, from the League of Cities about legislative uh, issues that might be impacting um, the county and, and local uh, governor, uh, governments like ours. So. ACCOC was kind of this this thing that was created with this idea that it was going to try and expand statewide and I, 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 from my perspective I think also be sort of an advocacy um, like the League of Cities and they wanted to spread to other cities and in some ways I think it, it sort of was a temper tantrum um, by a group of folks uh, in Orange County that said the League of Cities, the Orange County chapter was not providing what they wanted. So um, I think they created this, this other entity, it went forward, and I think at the beginning it really kind of matched what the uh, Orange County chapter of the League of Cities was doing. Um, some of the training, some of the uh, uh, meetings, and even some of the um, city selection kind of, uh, um, like for the LAFCO, those type of uh, um, uh, meetings that they would have. So. Um, all along, I always questioned why we needed to pay dual dues. Um, I wasn't seeing the value at the beginning um, because it was really more, I think, focused towards other cities in the county that really had some kind of a, an issue to really kind of um, take up to the state, and they were not getting resolution through the League of Cities. So um, I don't think they <coughs> served us as well as they could have early on, but then you know, maybe one could question whether Orange County Chapter of League of Cities was also doing the same thing. That said, I think when we're looking at fiscal... Um, you know, dollars going out, and I think uh, you had mentioned, uh, uh, Mark or, or Shelley, about uh, watching hundreds and, and five hundred dollar kind of uh, items on the budget in the in the budget standing uh, committee. Um, this is yeah, a, a significant amount of money as well. So, I seconded uh, uh, <coughs> Councilmember Hasselbrink's motion to to actually kind of put it out there, and I think. If we're not attending the meetings, if ACCOC is not really serving us um, and, and we're not really engaged in and uh, participating, I think that's kind of the other part, um, maybe we ought not to be a member of that. And I think the latest thing that came up, um, I know there's been a real kind of uh, issue on the whole um, homelessness uh, advocacy that they've taken on, the League of Cities, I mean the, the ACCOC. Well, in a sense, it's good to have, uh, I think, a regional leadership in that. Um, on the other hand, are they really serving the greater county um, well in terms of that? Are, those, are they listening to the inputs of all the cities? Now, I think um, Los Alamitos, we have a unique situation where we have the base here. We have veterans services. We have uh, the Long Beach VA just down the road. So we are in a really good location to a offer those type of services as a, you know, for the homeless vets. And it, it, again, part of that, that you're on, uh, city manager on that task force, the uh, SPA, the... Uh, yeah, the North Orange County Service Planning yeah, Area. area. This, so, so that, I think we bring certain of that, but... Um, when I went to the ACCO meeting, ACCOC <coughs> meeting uh, on, you know, you know, at the invitation of Mayor Edgar, who could not be there, it was almost like they were kind of forcing an allocation on all the cities. 
And so is that someone who really is serving us or really partnering with us? And that's <coughs> I think the thing is, even if we weren't a member of that uh, at that time, um, we'd still have the same situation where, you know, what can you do, O Los Alamitos, to um, help this homelessness uh, situation? And, you know, again, our allocation were, um, was 10 um, permanent supportive housing, PSHs, somewhere in some unused piece of land in the city. And, it, and think again of a, of a tiny home kind of uh, situation with all the services. So um, I think that um, in a long way, I, I don't know that being a member has brought value to us. I think we've brought value to ACCOC, but not in terms of um, direct participation and advocacy. So um, I second that, and uh, I'll, I guess we'll see what happens when you put it to the vote. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else have any other comments on that? I guess the, the one question would be, you know, is there urgency to do this now? Um, I'm not hearing many positive uh, or many reasons why we should stay uh, in the ACCOC, but if there's no urgency, I, I do kind of like uh, Councilmember Murphy's suggestion that we take a look at all our memberships and, um, and, and perhaps decide at that time when we're comparing what each one provides. <coughs> um, okay. Okay, yeah, um, you know, my perspective is um, I definitely watched this organization be formed and I, d I don't think that uh, it lived up to its expectation. Um, you know, a little bit of the impression I got on this homeless issue um, is that I kind of felt a little bit like they were being utilized almost as a lobbyist and we were the extended staff for that organization which is kind of opposite of what we're supposed to be you know they they shouldn't be bringing these solutions and then having all the cities try to support it um, I think you know we are trying to get together as a city to find a common ground and use them as a facilitation point so we can kind of mesh with cities so um, you know for that reason uh, you know and to address uh, Councilmember Murphy your view um, with SCAG um, and some of these others, um, I, I think, why can't we do both? I, I think that if we know now that this one's not working out, um, you know, and, and, the, and by the way, the invoices due was due like two months ago. So at, at least, at yeah. least. And, uh, and I do, you know, I have had inquiries like, you know, I feel like I'm behind on my payments. Um, so my preference would be, I mean, if we're going to do this, uh, I'd be supportive of that, especially if uh, after listening to what I've uh, heard up here, um, and we can't uh, find that. But uh, Councilmember Murphy, I, I'm very interested in, in your idea. Um, you know, with SCAG, it's so bittersweet because I was on SCAG for two years. Um, but, you know, when I remember being on that board, and it represents Westminster, Seal Beach, a whole slot in between i would actually go to the cities and put on workshops to talking about the regional plan the regional comprehensive plan the transportation studies and i haven't we haven't had a skag presentation from people in a while um the you know the, the one thing you know they put on the conference once a year so we can kind of go there but um you know i i think it was westminster who dropped out of it when they were having really hard financial times and they basically didn't pay dues so don't, that don't, that only meant that you didn't get to vote but you still were able to participate or at least be uh, on the distribution for the material um so i i i would uh i'd be very interested to support your action to uh, bring the the the, all of the fees of the different organizations that we're paying move that forward too for next month you and know, take a look at it. It's hard to keep them all straight. And uh, last time we, you know, when you look at it as a whole, you realize the interaction of each one. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't want to take one separately. And, mm. and I can, I can, if I can add, Mr. Yes. Um, you may want to consider that hybrid if you want to consider yay or nay tonight on the dues specifically for ACCLC and then come back at the next meeting we can update we did that like you have all said we did it a couple of years ago with all the dues put them on the table discuss all of them and determine you can determine that night which ones you want to stay in or if there are any others that you want to move out and then there could be additional follow-up like request a presentation from SCAG or any of the other organizations it doesn't have to happen all in one meeting but um, just want to throw that out there and then from staff's perspective about ACCOC, I really feel comparable to the comments that the full council has said. Um, I will say that, in my opinion, the, the manager, the new executive director, has made improvements in terms of making an effort for that group to try to make a regional impact. Um, but there are a lot of duties or their mission 
overlaps with the League of California Cities, as Councilmember Hasselbrink said, and the legislative piece, the advocacy piece, is being handled by the League of California Cities. We get our updates on a regular basis. We adopt or we support or oppose and have the mayor send a letter based on our legislative platform, and the League is tied in really well for us on that. And then in terms of um, networking, I mean, I think a benefit of both organizations is networking, but you can accomplish that from either one of the two organizations. It doesn't have to be both. And then from the, they are behind the establishment and the moving forward of this potential housing trust, which is a bill that has been brought forward by Daly. And, um, and I know that the council previously took a position in the resolution that was adopted related to that bill. And so we, you know, we're right now on record as opposing that bill. Um, they, again, I think they are making an effort to make an impact regionally, but as concerns have been expressed by the council, I have the comparable concerns on that potential housing trust that is being pushed through very quickly to try to get it on this ballot. And so okay. those are my comments. Thank you. I, I do have a question, uh, Brett. So um, in terms of meetings and opportunities, you, from your you know position as city manager, how, how much engagement have you had with ACCOC? Well, there, there's I haven't had a lot okay. yet. Um, so, so again, so I mean, when we look at the elected, it's not really getting engaged. And then if you're not getting engaged, then we're just paying dues and we kind of get uh, maybe yeah. a one way. Uh, transmittal of some information and from a staff perfect perspective the league can provide the oh, yeah. legislative oh, information and the networking for right. all the yeah. council and Tony's, staff Tony's doing a lot of that for us from the Orange County his as the Orange County rep he's doing a lot of that already Tony yes. Gardenas so okay um, so let me just ask uh, colleagues I I would like to be able to, to move on it, but I'm, I'm open, I guess, uh, Shelley, from your perspective, uh, time sensitivity. I, I, can I ask the SCAG one, didn't you already pay? I thought yeah, I there's saw that several of morning. them that we've paid. I mean, and based on previous direction from the council and uh, really being fully supportive as, it, you know, not all five of you were on the council at that time, but we there are certain ones that we have paid and we will, if we bring a staff report back to the council, we'll let you know which ones we have paid and haven't paid. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really held back on any payments other than the ACCOC. Uh, but also, it would be a forum to provide direction for future. If it's not this year, it can be next year if, if we have already paid it. Most mm -hmm. of them we've already paid. OK. So can I interject yeah, something real please. quick? <clears throat> you know, if we do, and I like the idea of looking at all of our organizations. I know it, there, it was listed in, in one of our budget uh, workshops that listed um, all of our associations and, and the annual dues that went with it. But I think what's helpful, because I know um, four years ago when we were talking about ACCOC, council wasn't real engaged. I got more engaged to some point, but staff was really engaged. So what I'd like to see is, you know, SCAG and the tools that you, ben that you benefit from from SCAG because it might not be us benefiting it, but it might be you guys benefiting from it as well. Yeah, that's um, a good point. So if you could kind of give you know your pros and cons about being members at a staff level, then we can kind of assimilate w what we get from it as well and then make an overall educated decision on, on future of Yeah, of that's a great suggestion. Okay, so we got it. Um, first of all, any other comments? So the, the motion on the floor, I, I guess, uh, you know, I would like to be able to go through and see if we get just a total consensus. I, I guess I would ask the maker in the second, uh, do, do you have an issue waiting a month to get it all comprehensively? If you don't mind getting the past due emails. <laughs> <laughs> and, including one today, yeah. actually. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, well, I, I, like I said, I, I, if they've waited three or four months, they could wait one more month. But I, I want to. I'd really like to get the council together, and so we have a unified voice on because these are really important uh, items. I'd like to take them to. Yeah. So might I suggest though, can we invite uh, both ACCOC, the rep, um, and then the SCAG, uh, as well as League of Cities? So you just get them all here, but um, maybe not. Well, I guess this meeting's fine. Over the July meeting, mm -hmm. one of the uh, opportune meetings to do that to kind of you know l let them sell it. Yeah, that would definitely be a possibility, especially because I did get an email today okay. from ACCOC. So if that's the direction of the council, I will let them know tomorrow and invite them to do the we, next. Do we meeting. have a new contact with Skaggs? I know Kevin Gluley got transferred over to doing something um, different. I, in I know, I know his boss, so I, I can I can him. talk he'll, to him. But uh, yeah, he would be the one coming to the meeting. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, just uh, direct staff to bring the uh, schedule back for next month. And I guess in the uh, budget, which we'll vote on now, the budget will have the fees accounted for at this point, correct? Can we, can oh. we withdraw the motion? Yeah, so uh, go ahead now, we'll uh, withdraw the motion. Uh, can I get a withdrawal? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, good deal. So uh, now let's take a look at the uh, budget and the, uh, can I get a motion for the existing budget that was presented tonight? I'll make a motion. Second. Okay. Um, I don't need a roll call bid on that, correct? Or would you prefer? Let's do one just to be safe. I can't recall okay. offhand. Okay. That means Wendy is uh, <laughs> at a break Edgar? point. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, go ahead and have a roll call vote. We have uh, Mayor Edgar. Aye. Mayor Kusumoto. Aye. Sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Kusumoto. That's fine. Councilmember Turco. Aye. Councilmember Hasselbrink. Aye. And Councilmember Murphy. Aye. Good deal. Okay. So uh, next item here is the City of Los Alamitos fiscal year 2018-19 master fee schedule update. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. The <laughs> Interim Development Services Director, Andy Perea, will do the staff report on this one. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. User fees are charged by the City to an, in to an individual that will directly benefit by that service. These fees shift the burden away from the general population of the city to the individual that receives that benefit. Some of these types of fees include um, building permits, CUPs, alarms, recreation classes. <clears throat> Prior to developing a fee, a study must be done to determine the city's actual cost to provide each service. A city cannot charge more than the cost to provide the service. In 2015, the city retained the services of NBS Consulting to prepare a comprehensive fee study. That study was completed and approved by the city in July of last year. <coughs> Before you this evening are fees that were adopted <coughs> last year with a proposed 3.8 CPI adjustment with a few changes to the existing fee schedule. These changes are primarily in the Development Services Department and they include fees based on recalculated amounts supported by the NB NBS approved study and staff cap retabulations and approving adjustments that eliminate, reduce, and modify other fees and charges. <clears throat> Included in the proposed free fee resolution is a policy that requires an annual review and update of the fee schedule that incorporates the CPI. This policy is consistent with the rec recommendations of the NBS consultant and to keep pace with the cost of inflation. The proposed fee update has been presented individually to the members of the budget uh, standing committee. If approved, these fees would go in effect in 60 days, so um, April 18th, and would add revenues of about 21,000 to the city's budget. And unless there are any questions, that includes my report. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Let me go ahead and uh, bring this back to the council. Um, let me just look here. Does this mm -hmm. uh, also have to be opened up for public comment? Yeah. It's a public hearing, yes. Yeah, so uh, anybody in the public wish to make any comment on this? No, not at all. Okay, so uh, we'll bring it back to the City Council and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, have an open discussion up here. Uh, who would anybody like to make a comment on this? Yeah, I mean, we, we reviewed this during the Budget Standing Committee, um, as Andy mentioned, and it, it all made sense to me. It all, it's all very logical. Um, I guess the one, the one issue we did discuss is um, the valuation-based inspection fees. Um, you know, if you take a look at those, those are kind of you know they it's a it's a it's an amount of uh, let's see here twenty nine dollars for each thousand um, dollars between twenty five thousand and fifty thousand and then it goes you know for the next uh, next amount uh, for um, anything over you know, up to a hundred thousand it goes to ten dollars then it goes down to four dollars then it goes back up to five dollars then it goes up to six dollars you know, if a resident's trying to make sense of this, it's a little bit confusing. And I know we talked about in, in future, um, you know, in, in the future, we'll bring some clarity to that and some consistency, consistency to that. So right, um, right. I, I, I just thought I'd mention that since, uh, since that is potentially an area of confusion for our residents. Right. Um, I'd recommend that uh, before next year's budget cycle that the consultant relook at these numbers. And the methodology, in my opinion, is correct. Uh, but I'd want her to go back and check the methodology and her numbers for the, the uh, multiplier and make sure that uh, she's still comfortable with those numbers that she presented to the city. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? I'll move it. Okay, there's a motion. Second. 
All right. Uh, I think uh, we'll have a roll call vote on this one. I don't want to be last. Councilmember Murphy? <coughs> Aye. Councilmember Hasselbrink? Aye. Councilmember Cherko? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Kusumoto? Aye. And Mayor Edgar? Aye. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, 12A personnel changes related to the organizational study. Uh, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. This is an item that's related both to the adoption of the budget and the implementation of the organizational study that was previously approved by the City Council on May 11th. And so um, the items that are before you include job descriptions and salary resolutions of those new positions that were approved by the Council as part of the study and the salary resolutions in total for both the non-represented group and the Teamsters Association. And so that's, this is something we bring forward with the budget adoption every year for the Council consideration. And this year it does also incorporate the changes that were approved in the organizational study. And <clears throat> Great. Thank you for the staff report. Anybody have any questions from the Council on this item? Seeing none, uh, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No. Uh, next item, 12B. Uh, this item is a request uh, for Attorney General Becerra for a roundtable discussion. Uh, this is an update that I just uh, wanted to provide. Um, if you'll notice in the package, I think, let's see what the date of the letter was. On May 31st, uh, I sent a letter off to Javier Becerra, the Attorney General, just requesting a town hall discussion. Um, very similar uh, expectation of when I sent off the uh, President letters that uh, wondering if they would respond. We actually got a fairly quick response uh, saying that they were interested, they were going to check their scheduling and, uh, and go from there. Uh, since then, Friday, I think it was, Wendy? Uh, we did get uh, direct uh, coordination with uh, Becerra's office, of which they uh, basically let us know that they were not going to be able to uh, have a discussion on this item. Um, so I think what the hope was, is the expectation was a little bit of really just trying to be able to look and see with um, you know, Becerra's focus on, on this and some of the things that he said is to really use this as an opportunity to educate the community a little bit. Um, also to talk about this from uh, when we say it's around table is just to get a perspective uh, if you read the tense or the kind of the 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 context of the note it was really a kind of a humble way please explain to us from your perspective um, you know so that the community can understand that um, at the time that I put this on the agenda what I was hoping to be able to do was to be contemplative because I was very encouraged that we did get a preliminary view that the uh, schedulers were actually looking for a time for Becerra to come down um, and what I started wanting to think about is that if we were going to actually do this um, I wanted it to be something that you know when they would call down and say hey look what type of forum is it where we where would this forum be uh, what would be the the format of this forum and how would we ensure that it was something that would uh, meet an expectation of our community uh, and all of those questions I felt were more appropriate to come and bring a, this to the uh, open city council to have a discussion with all the council members um, now that we've got the determination on Friday that uh, this is off I just uh, again I guess I would put this out there um, I any comments or thoughts obviously we're not planning it uh, there is um, another uh, candidate that's uh, running now against Attorney General Becerra who's uh, Judge Bailey uh, out there and so I didn't know if this would be an opportunity for any sort of a forum but I just I guess I just want to put it out there and if not then we'll just close this off in the same way that it was brought up um, with that I'll bring it back to the council and see if anybody has any comments so um, I'll, I'll go thank you uh, mayor so I know that uh um, I, I was keenly interested in this and, and we had discussed that after your uh, appearance in one of the news programs where you had in, made the invitation to uh, Attorney uh, General Becerra and I thought that would be a really good thing because um, I have heard him say many 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 times that uh, SB 54 the California Values Act is designed to work in concert with the Constitution of the United States which is really what we took exception to. So I, I looked at that as an opportunity for us to get educated and, and maybe as members of the public had asked us to uh, you know, reconsider um, you know, this, this ordinance that we put in place, maybe after this interchange with uh, Attorney General Becerra, we might come to that uh, realization that yes, maybe we uh, overstepped and, and went a little bit too far. So that's kind of how 
I, I looked at this thing and I still think it would be um, a good thing to continue this on in some fashion if we can have a community forum. We can still make the invitation, uh, establish a date and uh, see if there's any kind of um, uh, you know, um, feedback is may maybe that uh, would be appropriate and maybe the uh, Attorney General and, and maybe uh, the opponent of the Attorney General um, would come here and, and help us understand the, Calif <coughs> the California Values Act and um, how it works or doesn't work in concert with uh, local control, uh, protecting the public and, and even the, uh, the rights of both you know, the legal immigrants and, and the uh, illegal immigrants who also have whatever rights that they're afforded. Uh, I know when they uh, cross the border, they get some kind of due process and understand uh, all those issues. But I, I think that I'd like to see us at least try and set something up and maybe if we build a forum, maybe they'll show up, maybe they won't. But that, that'd be my kind of input to this uh, council and I'll listen to the discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Sure, thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Um, I'd be a little bit concerned about inviting Judge Bailey just because he is running for election and I don't want it to turn into a political platform. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't have the authority or their power to really explain SB 54 um, from an insider.